Gambler Jake Green is out of jail after seven years in solitary confinement, having taken the fall for his boss. During this time, the time has taken him inward. He has been shown the game and how to win it. Mm. He has one final lesson when he turns up in Vegas looking to exact revenge on his perceived enemy, the corrupt casino boss, Maka. Mr. Green still believes that cash is king and that having money and power is winning. The spirit must reach us wherever we believe we are. This is the story of redemption through the exaggerated filter of gangster respect and fear. Here, at a gross level, can the game of human life truly be seen. Everything we do is motivated to maintain a facade, a self-concept. That is why we stay in terrible jobs or bad relationships. We desire to be right about who we believe we are. We stay for that slap on the back that says you are a good guy, a good gangster, a good father. The greatest con that the ego ever pulled was making you believe that he is you. That is so <laughs> That his thoughts and feelings are yours. Wow. So it's like a hijack of identity. Yeah. And, and the greatest con is making believe that he is you. We do not always recognize our mighty companions when they show up. Avi and Zach teach Jake that he is still in prison and that it is his mind that needs to be freed from the game. So he's got out of prison, he thinks he's a free man now. He's got his money back, his old gangster ways, and he's going to go get revenge on the, the boss that put him, sent him away to jail. Show him, you know, who's, who's, who's really boss. In the truly practical application of the principles he has learned, they lead him through a series of assignments designed to flush the ego who in this movie is called Mr. Gold. The Mr. Gold sees everything of the world, it's the ego's world, and to transcend Mr. Gold fully into awareness. Mr. Green must give all to have all. It's a lesson from the Course. To have, give all to all. And then he's going back to kill, to kill the guy that he thinks has put him in prison. And, and these two Holy Spirit characters step and show up and say, oh no, oh no, no, no. That's not what the assignment is. You're going to give him exactly what he wants. And it goes against all of his instincts for revenge. Mm -hmm. So the Spirit's going to take his mind and flip it around and, and show him through like almost like casinos and almost Las Vegas symbols about the way to go back to God. <laughs> through, through the thing you'd never imagine. Who is Mr. Gold? Mr. Gold is a symbol for the ego. He's the old boss, right? Ma Maka's, Maka's the boss. Oh, sorry. Mr. Gold is someone, it's everyone refers to Mr. Gold in the movie, but nobody knows. So it's uh, almost like, oh, Mr. Gold, fear it, fear it. It's just, uh, you have to fear it, but it's just Fear, like, power, like money, all the things ego. that the world offers. Mm. Fame is, is Mr. Gold. And Maka, who's in the it's place uh, in the... Rayliata. Rayliata. Ray the Outer plays a oh, great yeah. mock. Oh, wow. he plays a vicious gangster. And oh, the end scenes. I think of all the movies, clips we show, people, their mouths drop and they rave and they tell all their friends, they run out, you've got to see this one scene, my God, it's, I've never seen a scene like this <laughs> in a movie ever. Because it shows pulling the mind away from the ego mm -hmm. in, a, in a showdown in an elevator scene, because uh, Jake is afraid of tiny spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit yeah. takes him into the tiny space of an elevator and stops it. You know, everyone's afraid if they're in an the elevator that it will, mm -hmm. it will stop. They take him into his greatest fear, so that he can face the imposter. And, and it's, it's a very intense scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing that they even made a motion picture out of this. But you'll remember, <laughs> you'll go home tonight, if you remember one scene, you'll remember the elevator scene, you know. Because that's, that's like a showdown of, of the spirit overcoming the ego, mm -hmm. and transcending that fear forever. He, and ooh, once he does, you should see his face, 
this, the main character, he's just, oh, so serene, and so clear, and then he has to face one more giant temptation, you know, by the ego, after he reaches the, the calm, almost like, and now, demonstrate it, show it, mm -hmm. show, prove it, show that you really have reached that clarity and serenity. Mm -hmm. And in a truly magnificent elevator scene, he recognizes that the voice of fear is not his real identity. Mm. Now, truly released in a state of forgiveness, nothing can touch him. So he goes, <laughs> he goes into a state of perfect, like, invulnerability. <laughs> and it's all in 45 minutes. This is the Holy Spirit's pick for us tonight. <laughs> they said, oh, we asked the questions. Mm. And it's very direct. It's almost like the Spirit wants to take us as directly and rapidly as possible back into our remembrance of our true self. And the ego is heavily defended and so, you know, the pride, you'll see as we move on, the pride is his, his greatest block. Yes, he still has anger, he still wants revenge, um, he still believes cash is king, and power, he's got all these egoic beliefs, but the Holy Spirit is like coming in with a very strong intervention. And we're going to see some pretty direct scenes where the Spirit's just going to give him a whole context about this world and Mr. Gold and and this is a game you can't win because mm -hmm. everybody's challenged to be successful in this world, to win the game, mm -hmm. to play, meet the world on the world's terms and do do well. And then they're basically going to say, no, it's actually, it's a game you can't win. Mm. And you're still in prison, you know, they're going to point out to him, it's still in his mind. But he's, he's still pretty resistant, even though he's, he got the thing about the disease and dying and everything, you know, he's, he's got quite a lot of, of resistance. And, and he will have, he's, he's identified as being a gangster, so. It would be like going from gangster to enlightened, from gangster to Ramana Maharshi, you know, just in one, one swing. So, it's, but it's such a good teaching device because, you know, you, you can see for yourself, like, ah, oh, this is where, it's actually his pride that is where the resistance, the, the sacrifice idea comes in. Everything that he's, Resisting is coming from pride. Yeah, it's kind of like, even with healing, like, if someone, will say, had received an instantaneous, an instantaneous healing, um, they may be so threatened by that healing that they may try to kill themselves, because it's, it's too much and it's too radical. In other words, like when we think of sickness, even in the body and symptoms, the ego mind selects those symptoms. It, it actually selects the symptoms. And then, sometimes you have to have a mixture of magic and miracle. There has to seem to be doctors or agents or operations or something. Because the mind is too terrified of, of healing. It's like too shocking of losing control of its own personal identity that that it actually would kill itself. And then it's a similar thing here with the giving up of judgment. That if the judgment was given up too rapidly and the ego had too sharp of a reaction, you know, it may be like a point of despair or hopelessness for the ego. Almost like a, like a suicidal tendency. So, it really has to be slow because, because it's, the ego just is apt to be perceived as personally insulting, and and when there's that much resistance, then the, it's like the healing has to hold off. Mm. The mind has to come to this healing willingly mm. and voluntarily. Otherwise, it feels like there's like God is coercing a healing or something. And it's kind of like in the course where where Jesus says, when you try to, if you have a baby that takes a hold of some scissors, the scissors are sharp. But, if you try to just pull this, rip the scissors out of the baby's hands, the baby will, will cry. Because it's taking its hand on the scissors, even mm -hmm. though it can harm it. It's, 
it likes the scissors mm. in those hands. Mm. You know, like when babies grab a hold of something and you try to pull it away from them, mm -hmm. even if it would harm them, they scream. Because they don't know. But they don't know. And it's the thing like judgment is really damaging in awareness to the mind, but if it would come off too quick, it'd be like a huge reaction, almost like a temper tantrum. Mm -hmm. Like a, like a scream. So, so they're working with him and, and he, you're working to get to hear all of his thoughts. You know, he's been doubting their motives all along and we'll see how that intensifies because it's pride. Those thoughts are all pride and, and, and the spirit is trying to say, you know, let get those thoughts away, let give up those thoughts and, and the pride is like trying to hold on. But because this is like a mini movie, we're going to see it all kind of in a in a very focused way. Mm -hmm. It's almost like taking many many years of awakening and it's compressing it down to, to like a 45 minute mini movie of what the whole process is, with the key points along the way. Like you have to follow the instructions. The spirit knows the way. The ego doesn't. The ego will throw up all kinds of defenses and resistances to it as if it's being conned by the Holy Spirit because he's so suspicious he's just used mm -hmm. to being conned mm -hmm. and that's the way it goes in in uh, oftentimes in relationships we were talking like you were going to get married and all of a sudden there's this rapid turn away almost strange and everything but you know in this movie if it goes, if it's too threatened, you know, then uh, that would that would shut down the whole process. There has to be a sense of steps, otherwise it just gets too much, too fast, and mm. the mind just wants to shut down. The money was his king, so it was very hard for him. It's like, the, mm. and so they had him lending money to all the ones who can't pay him back, and his rule, one of the rules was. Uh, they have to pay something back. Like you gotta give something. Mm. Like I gotta get something. That's Someone's gotta pay for. Like yeah. And so they had him give away, give away, give away money to all the ones who don't have like nothing to pay back. And it was like, uh, yeah. So that was like kind of a, like a stepping stone. Like of course to have give all to all. It's yeah. Like the Holy Spirit reverse is starting to reverse. <laughs> All the ego believes, yeah. but you have to actually step into it to to see that you're healing. Mm. When you've always been take, 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 then mm -hmm. the first lesson of the Holy Spirit is the three lessons is to have, give all to all. Mm. Yeah, and the thing is, even like in the movie, he came to that like because it was painful for him to give away, but he can't. He came to that himself too. That's like also like Holy Spirit's curriculum. He's like, no, like, like, I can't take anything back. So that was like, that was over. So now that was like, pushed him into this. That was like a stepping stone into whatever is going to happen, like here, right now. And it's really the teaching of the course. The, the workbook lessons are set up where Jesus says, he's even going to give you 365 lessons, but he says, here's the two rules, you know, two guidelines, you know, and don't transfer the, the training, don't do more than one lesson a day. And then he says that if you can achieve, if you can forgive one person basically, mm -hmm. it will transfer to everyone in the whole universe. Mm -hmm. It's not cumulative. That's why even with relationships, if you have a partner and you make a commitment to hold no grievances, mm -hmm. that you can go just from with one person and seeing one person with no past, springs you back into eternity. Whoa. It's not cumulative, it's just all you have to do it for one instant with one person. It's like, the, it's like it can, he says it can save you thousands of years, lifetimes. And, and he says, even he talks about meditation, as he, Jesus calls meditation, it will actually get you where you're going, but Jesus calls meditation tedious and time consuming. So now you're dealing with the Master. Anyone who calls meditation tedious and time-consuming and has 
as a better way. He says, your way will be a holy relationship, which is basically see just one person without a pest. Mm -hmm. Just one, for one instant, mm -hmm. and you're back in eternity that quick. Mm -hmm. So now, what they're going to do with Jake is, he, his whole motive was revenge against Maka. So basically they're saying, one more, one more lesson here, one more assignment. You're going to have to go up and don't say it here, you, you know, give him whatever he asks. And that's the last thing he wants to do. He wants to go up and kill him. <laughs> and they're telling him, go give him whatever he asks. It's like the total reverse of the ego. Just in one swift move to free him of all his pain, of all his suffering, of all his human life and everything, just one thing. So this is this is like the major setup, and this is going to set up him to go upstairs upstairs into Maka's room in the middle of the night and face him, and then you get to see the ego roaring because the ego wants to kill him, <laughs> and the spirit is like, now remember what the lesson is here, and then eventually it takes us right into the elevator scene, uh, which is probably one of the most magnificent scenes ever recorded at at showing how to transcend the ego. So here we go, These, it goes pretty quick, but this is like all packed into a little short space, and it's just all there. Oh my goodness. This is actually how we started going around the country. What we did was we took clips from all these great movies. You probably could one last clip for tonight, we could, we could cue the nines. That he's just making the whole thing up. So he <laughs> believes he has a, a wife and a daughter, oh. and he's a family man, oh and he's really tied into that, and he loves his wife, loves his daughter. And then, oh there's God. this blonde woman, has long blonde hair, and she's kind of inserted in to rescue him from his dream. And oh she's God. coming in, and she's going to make the rescue, she's going to start talking about, you forgot, you made this whole thing up. Oh my you're God. still trying to rearrange the pine cones. Uh, you know, you're, like you're I'm playing, the game. you're tinkering, tinkering with all the things in the game, but you don't realize that you just made it up. And this isn't you. You don't have a wife. You don't have a daughter. Let me tell you a secret. She whispers, blonde hair in his ear, you're not a man. <laughs> Never been a man. You know, she just comes zooming into the thing as the spirit to help him come out of it. And then he's got to make a decision because he, he thinks, he's so into the game of the characters of the, being the father and the, the husband and everything, and he likes that. And she's got to help, help him pull out of it because it's, it's keeping him from recognizing his whole identity. Then. He's got to, he's got to make the decision. He's been avoiding the light and avoiding the love by... Addiction to people. Addiction to people. He's got a people addiction. And, and, and she's coming in, he said, is this a murder? And she said, no, it's not a murder, it's, a, it's an intervention. Are you trying to kill me? No, it's not a murder, it's an intervention. Oh so she gosh. loves him so much that she's kind of like an insertion into his dream to save him misery and pain and, and suffering. But that's, most people don't, they think of substance abuse, but they don't, they, I think people who have been through really intense relationships can see that there's some kind of addiction going on, some kind of, we call it codependency and dependency that's going on. But this is giving it from a much higher perspective. Higher scope even. There's people on this planet are you, your drug of choice. Like we had, Avi and Zach were there to like give okay. very specific directions and context for healing and forgiving. They're coming in in, in the sense that he has totally, he has so much amnesia about the love and the light, the warm love and light place that he came from, which they'll remind him of. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they'll ask him, do you remember it? And he can remember vaguely about it, but it's been so pushed out of awareness. and. Also, he, he's forgotten that he's made up all the characters. All of the characters. And that's what, the ego made up all the characters. So when the mind's identified with the ego, it projects out all these characters 
and they're just acting out the, the fear, the doubt, the attack thoughts. And that's why we have to give up the attack thoughts in the mind, and then we do draw different characters sometimes, you know. I mean, if you think overall in the history of the planet, you know, the Jesus, the Buddhas, the Gandhis, the, the avatars that have come, and everything, the, the saints, you know, those are like reflections of our divinity Oof. that we're, we're seeing snippets. But, but it's even beyond the characters. Like, the Whoa. ego made all the characters, and the spirit's just using the characters. And it's like puppets to say, oh no, no, it's, it's completely beyond anything of this world. And, and so, this is so good because, you know, it shows all the human emotions, his attachments to being the role that he's playing, to want to somehow make it work, you know, find a way to make it work. All the things that have been tried, but are unsuccessful. This is giving a much deeper context to why our struggles have gone on for so long with no success is because we're still tinkering around. It's like moving the chess pieces, like they were doing Avi and and the Mr. and Jake were moving chess pieces all the time. And and Avi was even letting him win and then going, Oh, you're good at this, you're good at but then here comes the teachings like you still have to forgive, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's happening here. So now you just hear every word that comes out of her mouth. She's just like she's a spirit instead of a life coach. She's a spiritual life coach, mm -hmm. just giving him the full context of, you, you really do need to wake up, because you're never going to be satisfied just playing, playing some characters, playing a game that really doesn't have anything to do with reality. The characters can sometimes freak out when there's this, this intense, I remember how I said today, you never forget how frightened your brothers are. There's, that's what the unwinding is. It has to come. So he, they're getting in the vehicle here to go back. Now you'll hear, it, it's a beautiful scene. It's a beautiful, kind of familiar scene in the world. Husband, wife, daughter, in the, in the country, in a country mm -hmm. drive going home. Picturesque. And picturesque. Mm -hmm. And going home, the hearth, the home, where they'll have, they'll get into the blankets, and they'll, they'll have, they're getting pajamas and all the things we associate with good, warm, snuggly feelings. Meanwhile, we listen to the song that's playing in the background. I can't run far, I can't run far, I will always be found. I will always be found. In other words, the Spirit's going to find us. Oh. We think we're searchers and seekers in this world for the truth. Really, the truth and the light is coming at us. The light is like, oh, I didn't forget you, and I'm, I'm coming for you. Because you belong in eternity, you belong forever in love. So the song, as he, even you have these beautiful, I love this scene, all these beautiful familiar sights and sounds of, of a family. The song is, I won't run far, I won't run far, I can always be found, I can always be found. That's like the Spirit answering, I can always find you, I, I will always be found, no matter how far away into time and space I run. I'll always be found. I'll always be called back home. And this is what this movie is. It's really like, this little snippet of the movie is so strong, because it's like such a strong call. But now this is the, the easy. And this will take us into another scene where he's going to go and he's just going to lay at night, because he's going to have his eyes open, because he can't sleep. Uh -huh. um, he can't just go fall asleep business as usual. He's had a calling. He's been activated by spirit to come. She says, come, come with us. Come home. Come back. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I have met so many people in all my travels around the world. Some of them have out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, um, experiences of being abducted and UFOs. Uh, one friend, he was, he was like a businessman. He was like a really, really a, a solid identity as a businessman. And uh, he was walking with me one time, and he said, 
said, how did you get into all this stuff? And he said, well, I was walking along those streets and then something took over my body and walked me into a New Age metaphysical bookstore. And I said, well, how did you feel? And he said, well, I walked in and I, I was judging what was happening. And then when I walked into this bookstore, I thought, oh, it's one of the stupid, he's like corporate, you know, stupid New Age bookstores. And he's going, being walked around in this bookstore and, and judging the books, just thinking, this is a bunch of bunk and da 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 da. Because he's so identified as, a, as corporate. Mm -hmm. And then he gets walked to the back of the book, and it's the owner is sitting there smiling, going, Hey, I'm glad you came in. He's like, Oh, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> this and this. And, and then the owner looked at him and smiled, and then he went, I recognize you. And my friend was like, What? You recognize me? He said, Yeah, I recognize you. You're, uh, you're like a, an admiral, aren't you? And my friend, he, his hobby was sailing, and so he loved to sail ships like, a, like an admiral or captain and everything. And, um, and then the guy said, you know, you were, we were together, you were an admiral on the Palladian, Palladian ship. <laughs> what? What? And then he, he thought to himself, I don't know what that Palladian stuff is, but it, it started to, it resonated, and he was like shocked that it resonated. And then, then people tell me, after that, all these things unfolded, where he left his business behind, <laughs> he, he got into the book, yeah, what book was it? The metaphysical bookstore, he, he became, uh, he sold books, he, he became a publishing a, a, a metaphysical um, magazine called Way of the Heart, about oh, waking up. My God. It all started, 180. it all started with, it did a total 180. And, and I meet wow. so many people to hear their like everyday stories of, of how they were everything starts to turn. And then he met my Suzanne, this not the one that we know, but over in Australia. And he told and they tell you all their adventures. And this was the guy that brought me to Australia oh and took God. me on tours. And the more he traveled with me, he would like. He would have trouble functioning, like he, you know, that emptiness feeling you were feeling. He started mm -hmm. to feel like so giddy and happy when we would like travel oh along the coast God. of Australia. And then he would get up in front of the group and he'd say, you know what it's like to travel with this guy? He said, you get so like lightheaded and, and you lose track of things and you don't mm -hmm. feel like, he said, I can't, I feel like, I feel like at times I can't function. I can't function anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I was out with him walking and I said, well what did you mean by you can't function? He said, I don't feel grounded. Mm. I, feel, I feel like I'm just getting up there and soaring and it's almost like, the, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just getting more ethereal. So I just said to him, like the thing with the car going, the familiar, I said, well what would it take, Raj, for you to feel grounded? And he said, what would it take? If you came out to dinner with me and we both split a bottle of red wine and had a, a big steak, <laughs> a big, <laughs> that was, in his mind, that was the most grounding thing he could come up with, wow. is a big bottle of wine and a big steak. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> so we did, because he was having trouble, we couldn't count the donations, he couldn't, he started to get so like slap happy and giddy that he couldn't, couldn't do the thing. He had set up a tour, but he couldn't even do the functions of the tour. Oh my gosh. But there's so many of these stories of just people that are like, they finally just say yes to spirit, like, okay, I'm, I'm going for it. I don't know where this is going to head. But he's had a very, very happy, happy life. Um, but nothing that he ever planned. It's always something like beyond what you know you can imagine. Like the spirit just has using whatever you believe in to take you step by step. So, mm -hmm. so it's like meeting you, met him where he was at, and then again, and again, and again, and again, and Ooh, wow. you know, it's amazing. Just the stories just go on and on, boatloads full of people that I met, you know, walking up to me and just going, I need to talk to you. I had this out of body experience and, and it's freaky. And I'll say, well, what, 
you know, what was it like, and they'll describe it, and they'll say, yeah, and I was just, suddenly I was up in the corner of the room, and I was viewing, I was viewing my body on the couch. It was the freakiest thing. I started, I tried to swim back into my body, but I didn't, couldn't. And I said, I said, well, what was it like? They said, well, I could see, I could see, I could smell, I could, I could hear, I had all my five senses. And I said, but you were in the corner of the room. That's right. And it's, but I could see, I still could see and hear. And I said, but you didn't have any eyeballs. That's right. And you didn't have any ears. That's right. What does that tell you? That your five senses are not part of the body. They're part of consciousness. Mm -hmm. You don't even need eyeballs to see or ears to hear. So I would say, everything. Oh my God, it's true. I was in the corner of the room, I could see and hear everything, but I didn't have any eyeballs or ears. And I said, yes, the eyes don't see, they're just projections. The ego is tricking us to think that we're actually seeing out of eyeballs and hearing through, through ears. It's so sneaky, it's, it's made up a fake world, and then it convinces the mind that it sees through the body and hears through the body when it actually isn't. And that experience, that one out-of-body experience, I said, see that showed you that the five senses are part of consciousness, they're not part of the body. And, and I said, that's just another advancement in waking up. And was, you know, so you, every little thing that happens to anybody has like huge significance in terms of a much bigger picture of freeing the mind from the identification with the body. Because it's it's, it's a trick, it's like a grand trick, but the mind is so accustomed to it, like he was in there, you know, this last Jake, you know, he, he was very identified as the, the husband and the, the father. I like this world, he said. Yeah. Totally. You know. So when you say trick, a grand trick, is it an, an intentional, it's an intentional trick? Yeah, or oh, the ego is wanting to perpetuate guilt and keep the mind um, off you know, it, it, it convinced you that it's you. Is remember in the, the first movie there? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wants you to believe that it is you. And then once it does completes that, then it, it doesn't want you to ever see that it's not you. Oh my gosh. Because if you saw that you're not the ego, then you would be something else. And the ego doesn't want you to to see what you really are. Because of the shame. Because of the shame. If you if if you saw who you really are, then there's no ego. No. It's like game over. So th it gives like a whole context to this whole waking up in a very deep way, you know. And then suddenly when you, when you percolate these ideas and you start to give it over, then you start to say, wow, then what, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? How can mm -hmm. I open up to my joy in the fastest way possible? Mm -hmm to be of service to the, the whole universe, the whole one mind, <laughs> the one mind that's behind the veil of all the sleeping, sleeping minds, seemingly the sleeping bodies and whatever, it's all there. So... That last movie made me feel really scared. The one we just saw? Yeah. Yeah, because it felt so like, it's not exactly what happened with me. I mean, it's like, I don't know, I don't know what happened with Alan, like I don't mm -hmm. know if he had some experience like this blonde woman coming to him or whatever, huh. but it just, um, I don't know, I just like have this like feeling right here and I feel like all of a sudden I was like, oh my god, like nothing's real, like who are all these people, I all of a sudden started to feel really alone mm -hmm. and really scared. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that happens. That happens too because it, because it's like the associations that were familiar, Oof. that we were thinking was the love. It starts to loosen, so we're like, hmm, it's, love is still real, but it's if it's not there, then the mind starts fishing a bit, like, well, then where is it? Yeah. And we need. To, that's why we need so much love and so much convincing, and to help us be confident in the new way, because otherwise huh. it, the ego will interpret that something real is being taken away. Yeah. 
And when that happens, then the mind can start to close down and, you know, or it could even feel coerced, almost like the spirit's coercing. But the spirit never coerces. It's just the ego perceives that something valuable is, is being sacrificed or lost. So like I say, that's why I got into the Course like 25 years ago, and it's been, well, that was just when I began traveling, it's actually been 30, 30 years ago, but, but it was more just that attitude of like, okay, I'm going to take it easy and just show me, gently convince me, show the way, show the way. Because, yeah, probably the fear was coming up, just like you were saying that, that your, was it, um, Alan was, went to a spiritual teacher. Yes. And then so abruptly just left, almost like, what did that, what did she say? What did she say? What did the spiritual teacher say? And he wouldn't tell me. I asked him. Yeah. But I feel like if it was coming from a loving, like, spirit place, then you wouldn't be so abrupt. I, I could be wrong, I'm curious. And also, throw so you in. What's like, that? He would also tell you what was, if it was something that was heart opening, heart opening and helpful, yeah. he would want to share. share and extend that. Yeah, but because he didn't, it was probably an ego thing, or I'm just like so confused. <laughs> well, remember what I was saying, how how it all really works together for the good. In other mm -hmm. words, no accident that he seemed to exit, that you seem to come here, mm -hmm. and you seem to go through this weekend of like, mm -hmm. light bulb going off, insights and insights, all for the good. because it's, it's all for the good. In other words, it's the prayer of our hearts, it's spirit, you know, anything that's, that could hold me back from coming home to you, please take this from me. Mm -hmm. Right. And anything that would help me mm. open up, please bring it to me. And that's like our prayer of our heart. So then these beautiful witnesses just start coming, all the people and the puppy dogs and the baby and the music <laughs> and you know. And so it's it's actually working for the good. And it does get doubtful whenever we we look out at one of the characters and we say, What really was your motive? And Jesus at one point in the course he says it's dangerous to analyze the motives of others, Oof. because you always use your ego oh when you analyze God. the motives of others. If they'd only told us that, you know, <laughs> in the owner's manual, it's dangerous to analyze the motives of others. That would have kept us out of professions. We would never become lawyers. Oh my God. We would, <laughs> we would never have gone. We would never have been steered in those ways. Because I'm not getting into that. That's just total analyzing the motives of others and trying to manipulate things for an outcome. So, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing because in the end, it doesn't really matter in the sense that if you have that deeper trust, like I'm going home to God and God is, is sending me the perfect things and it, at the time something happens, like, like I was sharing with you, it's, it's when it's abrupt, it's, it's just shocking. It was just an initial shock with it. And then in retrospect, uh, we've even got a movie that's called Sliding Doors with Gwyneth Paltrow. We were talking about that. Yeah, yeah, where she gets fired from her job and in one scenario she catches the train back and she catches her boyfriend in bed with another woman. And it's, it shocks her initially, but it's actually helpful because she starts to see that uh -huh. Bye-bye. He's not the one that she's supposed to be with. And she meets this amazing man after she's shocked. And then in the other scenario, she, she doesn't catch the train. The little girl blocks her and she gets mugged and she gets home too late. And her lying boyfriend, the, the woman is gone and he's just lying to her and lying and lying and lying. And, and she feels intuitively something's off, but she doesn't have the evidence. Where the one scenario she got the evidence. As soon as she had the evidence, she said, Oh no, this is and she went into this amazing relationship that she really could open her heart up and so th those are like amazing movies too to show that it's it's really working together for our good, but the ego wants to judge that something terrible has gone wrong. 
and that we messed up or something could have been different and it tries to send us down a real dark interpretation. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, what, what's wrong with me? What, what did I do wrong? Like, yeah. That's why you're here, to be loved and, and nurtured, yeah. I think there's a, there's a part inside that it yearns so deeply for love. Mm -hmm. And what that equates to is that in heaven, love is perfect continuity. There's no breaks, there's no loss, there's no ending. It just goes on like we said, that clear day song, forever and ever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. And it's such a fond memory, it's an ancient memory, like it's still there. Mm -hmm. It's been so covered over. And so what I feel is what we've got here, and this is what I tell people when I go around the world and everything, is that these relationships, these configurations we're going into now, they're lifelong relationships. We are in a lifelong relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, we, and, and I see these people as I crisscross around the world, but we do crisscross, we, we invite, like I was invited here, then we say, come, you come where we are, come over here, and we go, you know, we, they are lifelong relationships, because they're awakening relationships, it's the purpose mm -hmm. that brought us together. If the hope, of course, is to find like a partner, like you know, a fiancé, or you have somebody, you're married, you talk about having a family and children, that's, that's continuity, that's, that's where the love seems to be, even in the family configuration, is there's, there's a steadiness. Mm -hmm. I'll stay with you, we'll, we'll stay through the, the good, through the bad, through the difficult. We'll be there together, we'll grow together. There's a continuity mm -hmm. that the mind is seeking. And mm -hmm. this very vibration that, that brought us together, kind of in this quantum way, is, is, is I just say, well, we're, we are lifelong relationships. You know, we're in it for the ascension. <laughs> You know, that the ascension has brought us together for that purpose. 